welcome everyone to this exciting session called It's the 20s. So why are we still testing like it's yesterday uh, by Justin Eisen and uh, Mr. Anand Bagmar. We're very glad that you could join us today. Without any further delay, Justin, over to you. Yeah, and thank you everyone for joining our talk today. Uh, myself and uh, my colleague Anand Bagmar are going to talk to you about it's the 2020s and why do we still test like it's yesterday. So a little bit about myself. I'm a senior uh, customer success engineer or software developer at Apple Tools. Uh, I've been in the QA automation dev realm for a little over 20 years now. A uh, lot, many, many years of writing uh, mobile automation and web browser automation. And so let's begin. So today I'm going to talk where I have a quick history of what um, about Appium, the challenges uh, that we face in building, uh, maintaining our mobile tests and frameworks. Why have we tested the way we have for so long? Uh, and then I'm going to introduce you, um, or Anand and I are going to introduce a new tool, um, Ultra Fast Native Mobile Grid, and the benefits of it. So, Appium 2012, the beginning. So, I actually was at this conference, um, the Sunningham Conference in 2012, and I saw Dan Cuellar's um, lightning talk about iOS Auto which touched me on many levels because it, it spoke about all the frustrations we were have, having at the time trying to automate our mobile devices. Really the two industry standards at that time um, were UI automation for Apple and then um, Robotium for um, Android, which were again, two different frameworks, two different languages. Um, so a lot of complexity, a lot of time and effort just to automate two different frameworks. And so, Having seen this lightning talk um, was just the, just opened my eyes and saw the possibilities. And so I believe, so did Jason Huggin shortly after Dan and Jason uh, got together, collaborated and built Appium. Thanks to Sauce Labs, they then backed that development and with led by Jonathan Lips and a bunch of developers there, they brought Appium to scale. Um, you know, shortly adding Android and then all the other capabilities, you know, until what we have today. So we do owe a lot of gratitude and um, uh, to these guys, to Sauce Labs for making App Appium what it is, it is today. So what are some of the challenges that we face in today's automation for mobile? So as you probably know, there are lots and lots of dependencies that have to be installed, you know, for both Android and iOS. Um, you know, you can run into versioning conflicts, um, you know, with, you know, whether it's your operating system, your Java node, could be the Xcode command line tools, it could be the uh, Android APIs, SDK levels, um, Appium version, maybe beta, maybe in too older version. So very, lots of conflicts that you can run into, which, you know, over time have gotten a lot better. You know, the Appium devs throughout the world actually have made a tremendous amount of effort into making this as easy as possible, especially with Appium 2, um, just getting the required dependencies is becoming a lot easier and a lot of libraries that they've added. To, to make that, and especially now that it's plugin-based, we don't have to necessarily install all these dependencies. We just need to install the dependencies needed depending on the plugins that we want to use. So that's great. We're heading definitely in a great direction there. Device flakiness. I think device flakiness has actually been, since the dawn of mobile automation, it's always been a problem. Especially years ago when it first started out, um, it was the wild west and devices were constantly changing. And, you know, we had new app vendors coming out, especially for the Android side or basically an Android side there. So I think in the last several years, that sort of kind of worked its way out as these frameworks and um, even the mobile devices themselves have matured. Uh, we have many, many different resolutions now and form factors with phones, tablets, tablets. And so we have to like, account for all these um, in our automation code to be able to automate across all these different resolutions. 
you know, we have app testability issues. You know, I could probably have a conference talk just on this topic alone. You know, traditionally, or a lot of times, we're just given these applications and we're told, go ahead and automate it. Well, it's not always that easy because some apps are very complex. So we really need to work with our, with our app developers to make our apps more testable. You know, that could include, you know, adding APIs or some type of hooks to help with the automation tests to change the state of the UI, maybe have hidden um, elements that only the automation framework can click and interact with to give us options to get the uh, state of the UI to a certain point where we can automate it correctly. Um, consistent locators, you know, that's always been a problem. It's always been a problem for web as well. And, you know, that's getting better as I think, you know, more and more development teams and automation engineers are starting to use the industry best practices such as accessibility labels um, to handle that, but it still can be a problem and a challenge for automation. Um, mobile devices or mobile apps um, utilize lots of gestures these days, and some of them are very complex. But then when you factor in all the different resolutions that we have to handle with, that you know, it may work fine on one device, but the gesture has to be completely um, modified for a different device. So that adds more uh, complexity or challenges to our testing. Then test scaling, you know, obviously the most efficient way to scale your test is through parallelization. And so that can um, lead to more challenges as well. Test environment issues. This is another topic I could probably have a whole, you know, uh, talk about is, you know, a lot of times as, you know, developers or automation engineers or testers were <clears throat> given ter terrible test environments where they're completely flaky. Maybe the code's not there. Maybe the machine that's running the test environment doesn't have the resources that needs to fully run the way it needs to. So it results in flaky tests. And accessibility, um, more and more so now, more companies are requiring that apps and even countries that their applications must be 100% accessible for um, users out in the world that have uh, disabilities. And so it's a, important that accessibility is, in, um, is tested and, but again, it adds another layer of challenges to do that. So let's talk about some scaling challenges um, and we'll go through some examples. And so what are some of our scaling options? So we can certainly just execute um, our tests over and over again, um, sequentially on every device. Not very efficient, but sometimes, you know, depending on how your framework's set up, you might not have any other choice. But of course, it's going to take you forever to test it across all your different devices that you support. Ultimately, the best and most efficient way is parallelization. And as I mentioned, that can add more challenges to your tests, especially when you consider um, applications that may have um, user sessions where you could only log into one user session on one parallel process or thread and another thread that can't use the same user. So then you have to have multiple users. And of course, you don't want to have your test set up where one thread um, changes something on a page that another thread of the same test needs because if one thread deletes something in the UI and the other tries to use that, it's going to fail. So that's going to cause you failures and flaky tests. But of course, with proper parallelization setup of your framework, you shouldn't run into that issue. And we have the Selenium Grid, which we've had for many years. And the awesome operating or OS developers or open source developers for it um, have you know, continuously improved it, especially now. I think uh, Selenium Grid 4 is just about to be released or has been released, and all the effort that Diego Molina and Simon Stewart have contributed to it, and all the other many uh, open source engineers um, has been a uh, great uh, benefit for us. And it has been a great benefit for many years. You know, a lot of companies actually rely on it as their core architecture, you know, to bring them business. Um, Docker images have come into play, you know, last three or four years, um, and that's even growing now with like Kubernetes and we're having these big ecosystems to help scale our tests using that. And then we have many cloud servers, test services out there to help scale our testing as well. And then finally, if you can ultimately just go to the cloud uh, 
servers themselves, such as AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, and run your tests from there using a wide array of different architectures, such as Selenium Grid, Docker Image, and so forth. Um, even you know, AWS has what they call AWS Fargate, which is a serverless-based um, service, and a lot of people test their mobile and web apps using that as well. So here's a standard execution of a Selenium test, or sorry, an Appium test running locally um, from your computer. So you have your test code, your computer, your Appium server, iPhone or Android, whatever it is, and an app server if your app requires it to send and receive responses from your app to publish the results of the UI on your device. So say we want to run a simple test and we want to run it on multiple devices. The first option is we just run it seriously, serially. So redundantly running the same test over and over and over again. Um, on different devices, um, which is not efficient again, but takes some time. But basically, this is a basic example of a test. You know, we launch the app, it goes to the UI, we assert something that, yes, something's displayed or it has this text value, or it's this color, or whatever assertion we want, just to make sure we're at the right place. We click a button, you know, we may add a wait here to wait until we've gone to. Um, uh, the UI state has changed, and then we verify um, several different assertions to verify that the UI um, is displaying everything we need to, or the few things we are looking for. But then we run into problems such as this. So you can see here those assertions that I wrote on the example before on iPhone 12 work perfectly fine. So. However, when we ran the same test again on iPhone 8, it only got the first assertion, the remaining assertions it couldn't find because it couldn't find the element to get to the next view. And of course, many of you on this that are watching this probably have seen this error as we have uh, many times before. So what happened in this case? Well, we obviously had an issue with our test code. So this was one of the points of failure that we need to account for to now fix it, which we simply can do by just adding a scroll to element. So it's a simple fix, but again, it's adding more code and more logic to our framework. And of course, our scroll to element may need to, um, uh, it could get more complex depending on all the different devices that we need to use um, in their resolutions. So let's take it a step further. Maybe we want to run our tests in parallel and we want to you know, scale it um, across either a cloud service, the Selenium grid, Docker containers. Essentially, it all comes down to, we're gonna spin up multiple Appium servers, which is either gonna be locally or it's gonna be on some type of cloud service. It's gonna to connect to each device that we want to test with. And again, it's the same flow, but now we've just cascaded the, the, the process. In processes. Um, and if we move on, and, and again, we're redundantly running the same tests across the same or across different devices to get the results back for our um, testing. And so here's a quick, very simple, um, same test, but now we're going to scale it. Um, we could do this in multiple different ways. Um, either we're using TestNG, JUnit, Mocha, RSpec, whatever it is, any all the different language bindings have different ways for parallelization. And this is just a simple linkless um, creating um, a thread for each of the capabilities I want to test, so the different devices. However, what can go wrong? Well, there's many things that could go wrong. You know, just the scenario alone, just testing on three different devices, potential 42 different failure points. Um, you know, there could be a failure with an app server. So like we talked about, you know, as I spoke about before, you know, flaky test environments. Maybe the communication between the app and app server and the, and the phone um, got in interrupted. Maybe the device that we're testing with either locally um, or on the cloud service, it, it had issues and it, it didn't connect. Uh, or the Appium server crash. There, there's just many points of failures. Essentially every icon you see on the screen and every single 
single error arrow back and forth, there's a point of failure. And so what have we traditionally done here? Well, we have to go and dig in and start looking at the logs, maybe looking at, at our app server logs, watching the videos in the cloud service, if that's where we're running it, and kind of figuring out what happens. But ultimately, nine times out of 10, we just run the test again and you know cross our fingers and hope that it passes. And if it passes, we just say, OK, great. I guess it was a fluke. But it's a lot of time uh, spending to debug it. So why have we tested this way as long as we have? Well, it's the mature. It's been the maturity of the native ecosystems, or probably a lack thereof. You know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it was sort of the wild west. You know, you had multiple devices coming on the market. Some some of these vendors that created these devices don't even exist anymore. Um, Apple was constantly making changes to the market and just things were not stabilized. But the last few years or so, that it's, it's becoming more and more stable. You know, we want to ensure that our applications run on all these different devices our applications support to ensure, you know, we, you know our customers can successfully use our application. And of course, if it uh, all becomes monetized and we want to make money if, if that's what our app's intention is. And historically, this was always the approach. You know, we didn't really have any other options. There was no real alternatives until now, which I'm going to kind of show you. So, introducing the Apple Tools Ultra Fast Native Grid. And so, it's the standard local approach, like I showed you earlier uh, a few slides uh, ago. All you have to do is run it on one single device, either a you know, Android, either a simulator, real iPhone. Um, right now we only support iOS, it will soon support Android. Um, and we just run it once, but we get the same results of all the parallelization we talked about before, um, all within the time of one single execution. And so here's an example test uh, that we did before. Um, if you notice at the top of the test, it's just um, we've removed the assertions because now we're going to implement visual checks. And the power of visual checking is it checks everything on the page. So every single element and every visual tribute of every single element is automatically asserted for us, such as the text, the color, the location. So if anything changes, it will be caught without us having to physically actually look at the device or the application itself. So no longer do I need to pick and choose to write certain assertions if something is displayed, because if it's displayed in the UI, a visual check will happen. Um, next, um, at the very bottom, you can see I could just set all the devices that I need to validate my application on. And finally, uh, in the middle there, um, we can, if we wanted to, we can write an assertion in a single assertion to verify that everything is visually okay and everything executed correctly on all the devices on the ultra fast grid. And so here are the results. You can see all our tests here, all the devices that we executed on, it executed within uh, around 37 seconds. So the execution of one gave me the results of 12 different screenshots uh, across all those different devices that I uh, configured. So a very efficient, fast way to test our script running on a single device instead of redundantly running the same test over and over again on multiple devices. I'm just showing you some examples. You get full page screenshots. Um, actually, if I go back here, uh, take note that you could actually set it in landscape and portrait, uh, multiple different capabilities built within the configuration. So perhaps let's maybe we want to take it a step further and let's kind of test with a, a bit more modern app application, not such a basic app that we had before. And so this is just an example to show you everything you, you can test all at once, uh, both functionally, make sure it's visually correct. We can also test localization and accessibility. So in this case, I'm going to just start two different um, Appium servers have two different phones 
but then get screenshots across all these different devices that you could see here in, in the middle, as well as visual checks across. And then finally, at the very end, I'll just go ahead and start the video. At the very end, I can write an assertion to test that it was visually passed and that it actually passed or failed accessibility wise. So uh, for the time it took me just to run it once, I get coverage across multiple devices very fast and efficiently. And let's just go ahead and take a look at the results. And so you can see here, now I have 72 total tests um, uh, captured. Two different languages um, across nine different devices and four different screens, giving me 72 uh, tests. And I could sort my tests by localization. Um, so I can see all my English uh, screens and I can then see all my Spanish screens across all the different devices. And so now I could go ahead and inspect some of the uh, UIs that were captured and verify just as a, an extra incentive to make sure that they are they look correct. Maybe, maybe the layout's correct. I could take a look at, um, now I could test the localization, or sorry, the accessibility. Um, so now I'm gonna verify the contrast. So here we have a failure. I have the option here to just ignore that failure if I wanted to because maybe I've, I've talked to my product team or whoever it is on in my company and says it's not an issue. And, or I could go ahead and just create a bug. And if I want to, I could simply just create a Jira ticket or a rally ticket or a few other um, bug tracker systems that we would um, use uh, throughout the industry and simply just message my developer saying there's an issue that was detected. So what are some of the features and benefits of UltraFast Grid? Well, it's a simplistic test authoring. Basically, you write and run once. So no longer do I have to uh, consider or think about all the different resolutions or all the different devices and have all these different um, conditionals within my code saying if it's an iPhone 8, then I need to scroll or if it's an iPhone 10 and do this. I just write it for one single device, one, one UI, one resolution with that in mind. So it makes my complexity of writing my testing much, much easier and much easier to maintain. Uh, everything is going to be visually perfect. So I know how visually my application looks and I have baselines based off that, based off those applications and the different resolutions of those. And of course I could get full page screenshots. So if we have applications that have long UI views that you have to swipe up to get, see the entire view, it's all captured for me. Less code maintenance. And so Inherently, just with visual testing, adding visual testing to any automation framework for functional based testing, it definitely reduces the code that you have to maintain. So, no longer do I have to maintain all these page objects, all these functions to assert different attributes on the UI uh, or gestures to get to, to do these assertions. The visual test does it for me so that all that can be thrown out and it's much faster and more efficient. Fast fit feedback loop, um, especially in today's CI CD world, we need, you know, everybody wants as fast as possible feedback loop. So now we can, because every, everything we're going to be doing um, with these checks is going to be across multiple different devices at once. Less points of failure. So no longer am I redundantly running the same test over and over and over again on different devices. I'm just running it once on one device. And so it reduces the point of failures. Of course, there can always be failures with the device that you're testing with locally or on the cloud service or with your Appium or your code. There's always going to be points of failures, but in this case, there's less. Uh, easier data management or test data ma management. So no longer, you know, as I mentioned before with parallelization, it adds complexity of having, you know, many, many different user sessions or accounting that one test is not 
messing up another test on a different thread, that's out the window as well, because no longer do you have to worry about that uh, as much. Of course, we could get contrast valid validation, which I showed you, uh, and everything is asynchronously parallelized. So um, uh, as it's running the test, everything's running on the Apple Tools ultra-fast grid in parallel um, without uh, you having to worry about any type of connections to um, any, any type of service. Uh, and then security. Uh, some of the benefits that um, with this offering, you don't have to upload your application to any service, uh, any third party. You don't have to open up any tunneling, um, firewalls, proxies to get um, it, to have the service talk to your internal um, uh, application server. And so you also then don't have to worry about any of your data or sensitive data in that matter being left on uh, any third party system systems. And so with that, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Anand, who's going to talk to you about the ultra fast grid for mobile web. Hey, thank you, Justin. I'm quickly gonna share my screen. Okay. So, hello everyone. Um, I hope you're having a wonderful APM conference. And quick introduction about myself. Uh, like Justin, I've also been in the quality space for more than 20 years. And I love dabbling with code. Quality is my passion. And I work in various different roles to help make the product quality better. So with that, Let's continue from where Justin left us, talking about scaling challenges for native applications. All the things that he spoke about for native applications, we have also seen for our browsers and it could be desktop browsers or it could be mobile web as well. This doesn't stop just at browsers or native apps. Hybrid apps would also fall into the similar category. The challenge is not really in validating the functionality across these different devices or browsers, especially when it comes to browsers. It's not really about validating the functionality, right? The way the pixels are rendered in the browsers that is still controlled by the browser's rendering engine. The browsers are W3C uh, spec compliant, so functionality would work fine, but the rendering can still be different in these cases. And this could be for various factors, not just the rendering engine, but also the devices where the pages are being rendered that also contributes to this fact. So what it really comes down to is, how do you ensure your application is working as expected? It is seen, the user experience is as expected, regardless of what type of device is being used by your users. It could be a phone, it could be a phablet, it could be a tablet, it could be a desktop browser, it does not matter. It could be portrait or landscape, does not matter. Each device has is going to render the pages in a slightly different way. And you need to ensure that everything is going to continue working fine as expected. The sizes of these devices are also varying a lot, which I don't really need to explain. Everyone is aware of these aspects. What this does mean though is how do you make sure the experience that the users are getting continues to work fine? Likewise for the desktop browsers as well, or laptop browsers. I don't know many people who would be using desktops anymore, but the challenge is the same. So the traditional approach which Justin was referring to for native apps is also of course seen in the browsers uh, landscape as well whether it is mobile web or in the desktop browsers. 
how do you really scale your execution to make sure your functionality and your user experience continues to work as expected on each of these? So the traditional approach, what you would do is, if not all, you have an identified subset of tests, which you would want to run on each and every uh, different type of device that you can get your hand on and ensure everything is working fine. This is a tried and tested solution and it works. It works reasonably well or as the scale really increases, it starts falling apart. There are also a lot of different techniques that you can use. You can build your own infrastructure uh, to support the testing of this, or you can buy or use the cloud solutions to test this as well. However, the challenges really are that there are far too many combinations over here. This is very slow feedback and it is error prone. So what can be done differently from a mobile web perspective to handle this situation for a mobile web? And that's where the same solution that Justin was referring to, the Apple Tools Ultra Fast Grid, can give us a lot of value by reducing the footprint of how many tests you are executing on each supported device or uh, browser. And what I want to do to showcase this is I'm going to keep my fingers crossed and do a live demo. What I have over here is an Android emulator that is running. I have a simple APM web test that I have implemented. And I have included a lot of different visual checkpoints using Apple tools over here. I'm going to run this test. As you can see, there is just one test that is running. And so far it seems to be continuing well. So maybe the demo gods are with me. We see that my test is actually loading the conf engine website for APM conf. It is going to click on got it so that the cookie pop up uh, disappears. And that really is my test now. Oh, actually I go to the schedule as well. I forgot what the test was. It's been a long time, but this is what my test is really doing. I want to make sure I'm able to get to the schedule page as expected and see the results out of that. Now, what happens at this point is in the aptitudes dashboard, you would start seeing the results arrive for this test. There was just one test that ran, but actually over here in the dashboard, we see there are 20 tests that are uh, running. And the speed of execution is going to be different for me uh, compared with Justin, because Justin is sitting in the US. That is the cloud server that I'm pointing to for uh, Apple tools. I'm in India, so I have to go all the way across the wire, uh, across the waters to get to the server. But if you look at this test over here, a single test I ran on my emulator, but I'm actually now seeing the results of that on a Safari browser, on Chrome, Firefox, Edge automatically, and it is highlighting to me what the differences might be there on the screens that have been captured. And this is not just about the desktop browsers. I have got many different types of devices that I have grouped the test by, whether it's Galaxy Note Plus, OnePlus 7, iPad mini in portrait and landscape mode. And automatically I'm getting the visual validations happening, the functional and visual validations happening from a test execution in a very easy fashion. So the solution gives you a lot of different advantages from the test execution and scaling perspective. Because you are running the test in your own environment, you are able to execute it really fast. You are able to test the functionality if it is working as expected. But with the ultra fast grid scaling approach, what you do get 
is automatic validation of your functionality and the visual rendering or the user experience from all your supported browsers and devices. And for that matter, I did not really need to run this test on an emulator. I could have very easily run it on a desktop browser. And from there, I could have still got the results from mobile web as well. So I hope this one aspect of scaling can be uh, useful to you. There are places where you might probably not find this useful. And that could be if you're using some custom components that are developed for different browser types, custom UI components. And if that is the case, then you want to definitely run those on individual browsers as well. But that would be a very small subset of tests that you're repeating on each uh, and every browser and that is supported whether mobile web or desktop. And the rest of the tests, you can get good value from this scaling approach. So with that, we will pause over here and see what questions you might have and try to address those. I will stop my sharing so Justin can also come on screen. Okay. So, uh, Justin, we have some questions. Uh, do you want to start taking that from the top? Sure. Let me take a look. Let's see, I don't, I still don't fully understand how it's different running tests on multiple devices, uh, browsers, thoughts labs or browsers that can you elaborate? Yeah, so it's it's a different different technique, different ar architecture, um, or different way of looking at it, um, based on sort of if you looked at how the slide that I showed of, um, a little while ago, where uh, everything's asynchronous. So I run it once. Our application code is um, sent to the ultrafast grid and then rendered on different devices. Whereas if you test on Browser Stack or Sauce Lab or several other cloud providers you're redundantly running the same test across multiple different devices. And so this way you run it once on one device and get the same results um, much faster across all the different devices that you would normally test on uh, in a redundant fashion. Uh, see. Next one is visual tests are great, but how do you ensure interactions are working as expected on different device browser combinations? Um, you want to answer this one, Anand? Sure. So based on what functionality you are trying to validate, you need to map out on what combinations of devices, whether real or emulator, you need to do that validation. In fact, the mobile test pyramid is a very good reference to follow in this case, to think about your test execution strategy, what type of test should run on what type of devices or interfaces. Can I run something in mobile emulation mode? Can I run this something on an emulator? Do I need to run something on a real device? So based on the type of test that you have and the impact it has or potential impact of the underlying operating system it has, since we are talking mobile, the operating system versions, custom OS versus stock OS in case of Android especially, you would want to categorize these subset of tests and make sure you've got a good spread of platforms, real devices that you actually test this on, not just emulators. And that would be the way to go. Uh, but it's taking very conscious decisions about which tests need to run where and what's the risk of something not working. I hope that answers the question, Naresh. Okay. okay, and that looks like Naresh has another question here. It says, based on your experience, what percentage of bugs, defects fall into visual rendering related issues versus logic or data related issues? Um, I, I guess I can answer this. Um, I mean, it really depends. I mean, uh, logic and data related issues um, is always, you know, plagued our 
industry for testing. I mean, really, we want to make our test environments or test deterministic as possible. So that a lot of times um, includes you know, setting up your test to be successful and deterministic by seeding your data using APIs or databases to make sure you get de deterministic data. However, with visual testing, you know, that can impact visual testing if you're not making your test deterministic. However, with um, at least with Apple tools, visual um, um, testing, we have different tools or different annotations um, to handle dynamic data such as layout. So if we have data that's changing, we could apply layout regions to verify that that same type of data is there such as an image or text and not fail in the future because the, the AI algorithm is gonna verify that that same type of um, object um, or type of object is there. Uh, to add a little bit more to what Justin said, there is also another very interesting aspect what visual testing can bring in the validations. A traditional test automation approach is a very deterministic approach, right? I know what actions am I doing and what are the validations that I want to do as part of that? What assertions I'm going to have in my test? But our pages are complex or our screens are complex. And because of uh, data issues, because of logic issues, it could be in backend or in the rendering logic that might be there processing the data. We might see unexpected behavior on the screen, which could be very easily lost in a traditional test automation approach based on assertions, because our assertions are checking only for very specific behavior, and you might miss out on other areas where the errors are manifesting. And that's where visual validations can give you a lot of benefit where all those differences will be highlighted to you. And in combination to the different algorithms, you could use it and tune it correctly to highlight the issues that are really gonna be meaningful for you to take further decisions. So that's where it's not a direct answer about percentage of bugs or defects, but the coverage that you get with visual validation increases your uh, the value of your test tremendously. And hence you will need to write less code, less tests, which Simon very beautifully referred to in his keynote earlier. Uh, this automatically helps you give that added coverage while reducing the code footprint that you have. Okay. Next one is: Did we specify? Did we specify on which devices we want to run that script? Uh, yes, yes, certainly. So um, during uh, one of my slides, I, you could set. We, we have an enum on the iOS device type. You could set all the devices that you need to test on. Um, same thing for both the mobile web as well. Um, so when you test on mo mobile web with the ultra fast grid, you could set a configuration. You could tell it all the different browsers uh, that you want to test on. Um, we also support IE 10 and 11, and you can. Uh, we have several different versions. And so I just want to, and this going back to the first question as well, what, what's the difference between you know, other cloud, traditional cloud services is, again, you just run this once, and for the execution time of just running one test, or you know, maybe several tests, you get the full coverage instead of redundantly running the same test over and over again on all these different browsers and different environments. Same thing applies to the native mobile as well. All right, um, thank you so much, uh, Justin and Anand, for sharing your experience and for this super informative session. Thank you, everyone. Thank Goodbye, you take care. Us. Goodbye.